Fulfill your heart's desire Take you to the place you want to go Keep dreaming of the land of your history And you'll walk in the streets before you know On wings of eagles they took to the sky Not sure how this magic carpet would fly Then cries of joy at the first shalom 50,000 Yemenites coming home My heart is dancing in Jerusalem Boker Tov, Tommy Deem, and welcome to another session of Soulful Psalms. Our psalm this week is going to be Psalm 48. Now, there have been a number of different things that have been said about this psalm. I'm going to start with the obvious. This is literally a psalm of Zion. It is a celebration of being part of the land, of being in the land that God gave us, and particularly the city. Now, you and I encounter Zion Psalms most often on Saturday morning, where we recite Psalm 126, where uh, we uh, uh, celebrate the fact that we were once prisoners or exiles in a foreign land, but we have now been restored uh, to uh, the land uh, that was promised to us, and it fills us with joy after many years of sorrow. And this is of a different order, but it is definitely a celebratory psalm about Zion, Jerusalem, uh, which stands as a metonym, that is a part that represents a whole, that is the land of Israel. So, And so as we face a time where we see half of the Jewish people uh, fighting uh, an existential battle with, a, with an entrenched terrorist organization on their border, uh, realize that uh, part of what has been our spiritual joy and our spiritual experience is our connection to the land, which goes back thousands of years. And so when the people of the land triumph, we triumph and we rejoice. And in fact, what we'll see in a moment is that the first, I don't know, third of this poem actually seems to be referring to some kind of triumph or victory in battle. Uh, but that's not the entire psalm, and I just want to call attention to a couple of issues before we get started. And the primary one is because it does refer to a battle, but it also seems to allude to the exodus from Egypt uh, and uh, different things. It's really hard to date this psalm or zero in exactly when it was composed. Uh, some scholars have proposed that it was uh, composed after the siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrian king Sennacherib III uh, was driven back and the city was spared. But at the same time, it makes references to enemies from the sea, which would be from the wrong direction because, uh, you know, Assyria is over there and the Mediterranean is over there. So uh, could it be another conflict that we that is not identified in the Bible. Uh, of course, we know that the Philistines uh, came to us from across the Mediterranean, so maybe it's a very early psalm. On the other hand, maybe it's a very late psalm. We don't know for sure. And it also presents us with a number of tricky passages that are a little difficult to translate, to uh, uh, Western translators have pretty much settled on some things, but uh, when you read it, you sort of scratch your head and you're like, what does that exactly mean? So anyway, we're going to maybe draw attention to the ambiguities as we go, but uh, let's uh, plunge into this psalm and take a look at it. All right. First of all, it has a superscription. Uh, it is a song, a psalm of the Korites. Now, 
for those of us who uh, read the Bible, we realize that this is a reference to the clan of Korach, who in the book of Numbers gets swallowed up into the earth in a supernatural bit of divine revenge. Uh, but apparently some of them survived and they even form a choir uh, in the ancient temple. And this is instructions for them uh, to recite this psalm, or maybe they composed this psalm. So what is that story in Numbers all about? Is it like, is it like a, I don't know, a hip hop grudge, uh, like between Biggie and, and, uh, and uh, Tupac Shakur, uh, where, you know, some other band wants to uh, humiliate the Korites with a story or something like, we don't know. We don't know, but apparently uh, at least a segment of the family of Korok was still around when this was written and may have been the authors. So just keep that in mind. Uh, one of the things you will see, and it will come back again and again, is how what is topographically, honestly, a very modest feature of the land, the Mount Zion, is lifted up bigger in imagination than in reality. It, it is seen as the cosmic uh, axis mundi, the pivot of the world, the, the place that's the most central of all places. And that's certainly true in the Jewish imagination, not so much uh, in terms of modern topography and modern understanding of the earth because it's a globe but you can see this tradition carries on well into the middle ages where all maps that are made throughout europe tend to put jerusalem right at the center and then the mediterranean spreads out to the west and uh persia and iraq spreads out to the east and then europe to the north and africa to the south as far as they can tell or what they've mapped so far. So uh, the idea, the imagination of Jerusalem at the center of the world uh, carries over into other cultures as well as our own. And of course, uh, when it comes to news, nothing uh, makes the headlines like whatever happens in or around Jerusalem. So it's still the case that Jerusalem captures the imagination of the world. So let's take a look at this and uh, let me uh, read for you uh, verses two and three. Uh, the Lord is great and much acclaimed in the city of our God, his holy mountain, fair crested joy of all the earth, Mount Zion, summit of Zaphon. Now, uh, Maybe you've had the experience, I've certainly had the experience, that even though it's a relatively modest hill or mountain, it is a mountain, uh, climbing up it is quite dramatic, and it really does invoke tremendous feelings, just as we might have tremendous feelings if we climb summits in Yellowstone or somewhere in the Sierra Madres, and we get to see the vistas from the top of that mountain, it feels like it connects us to something transcendent, and it's powerful. And that is certainly true with Jerusalem for all of its modest status. And I do want to call attention to this one feature, and that is at the very end of three, it says Mount Zion, summit of Zaphon, city of the king. Now that's confusing, and I'll tell you why it's confusing. Zion is the name of the hill in Jerusalem. Uh, Zaphon is traditionally a mountain further north, and it literally means north. Uh, but Zaphon is also the mountain upon which the god Baal dwelt in uh, Canaanite imagination. So what's happening here is actually a kind of coercive parallelism. It's saying that Zion, uh, the hill of our God, is in fact the equivalent of the hill of all gods. 
And so it is, um, I call it coercive. It's a claim. It's making a claim upon uh, uh, Zion that it is uh, the cosmic mountain of the world. So again, the imagination is much bigger. Uh, fair crested joy of all the earth, Mount Zion, summit of Zaphon, city of the great king. And it's not referring to whatever king is currently in residence in uh, the palace over on the top of Mount Zion. It's referring to the king of kings. Uh, through its citadels, God has made himself known as a haven. So the city itself, it becomes a metonym or part of a whole for God, who is the protector of Israel. So when you are in the city, you are in a sanctuary. You are in uh, a, the uh, lower part of the Godhead, and you are participating in a heavenly experience by being there. So on it goes, it describes this battle of fighting and trying to secure the city. And uh, that goes on until verse nine. I'm not gonna spend a great deal on it. Again, it could be referring to Sennacherib in his invasion in uh, 701, or it could be referring to some other seaborne invasion we're not aware of, all right? Um, line nine, the likes of what we have heard and have now witnessed in the city of the Lord of hosts. And Lord of hosts, uh, Adonai Tzvaot, could also be translated as Lord of armies. So it has a martial or military double entendre going on here. Um, in the city of our God, may God preserve it forever, Selah, which is one of those conclusionary expressions like, Amen. So could it be a completely separate psalm here that's been uh, adjoined to the later part? Maybe, but it's all about Mount Zion, so it seems to be one psalm. In your temple, God, this is 10, uh, 11, and 12. In your temple, God, we meditate upon your faithful care. The praise of you, God, is like your name and reaches to the ends of the earth. Now, this sounds purely monotheistic, and that suggests that this is a late psalm uh, because earlier psalms, as we've seen, like Psalm 29, seems to have a much closer relationship to Canaanite spirituality, and this seems to go beyond that. So it could well be a much later psalm. Uh, 11, the praises of you, God, like your name, reach to the end of the earth. Your right hand is filled with beneficence. The right hand of God, of course, is a, a metaphor for God's strength to help Israel. So it is God's right hand that he extends to us in the Exodus to deliver us. And so it is, we believe, that God is extending his best for us in all of our circumstances. Uh, let the towns of Judah exalt because of your judgment. And then there's an interesting little tidbit here that may refer to a, a, a practice um, that has gone out of favor, but still exists. So, you know, um, the Catholic Church still has this tradition of walking a route to a site of pilgrimage. These distances can be hundreds of miles. There are such routes in the United States. There's a very short one that you can take to uh, Chimayo in New Mexico, where there is a church with a miraculous tradition. Uh, there's also a route that you can take through the missions of California. Uh, and these, I'm sure I've never done one myself, uh, not being Catholic, but you know, I could. I, I, I've, I've hung out in monasteries for days on end. So you or I could walk one of these uh, routes and uh, it might be inspiring in and of itself, or a hike along the Appalachian. Or in Israel, there is what is called the National Hike Route. And you can walk from the north of the country 
to the south of the country uh, on natural hiking routes. It's something that many Israelis do when they're young. So anyway, here we have a reference to walk around Zion, circle it, count its towers, take note of its ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may recount it to a future age. So uh, circumambulatory, going around a sacred place. It's not like we've never heard of this. I mean, that's what happens when you do the Hajj to Mecca, is that uh, Muslims go and they circle the Kaaba, which is the sacred structure. And to do this Hajj is considered one of the five important things that you do during your life. Apparently, our ancestors had something similar related to the city of Jerusalem as a whole. It is a holy city, and uh, to walk a sacred walk is something that our ancestors did, and it's something we could revive. Point of order, uh, when I take uh, our trips to Israel, one of the things I love to do is take anybody who wants to up on the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And we walk around them. Now, we can't walk the entire route because of political issues. Uh, part of the route is the Temple Mount or the place where the Muslim uh, Shrine of the Rock is. And therefore, Israeli authorities don't want us uh, trying to circumnabulate that. They're afraid that there could be a Jewish uh islamic conflict along the walls so you can only go from the jaffa gate to the jewish quarter but that's worth the trip too and that too is a kind of sacred pilgrimage and is remarkably uplifting and fills one with joy all right now we're going to come to the end which is the peculiar thing um the verse 15, and it is, for God, he is our God forever. Uh, Lador, for the generation, Acharon, to the very end. Uh, ki ze Elohim, Eloheinu. Uh, he is God, our God, Olam, forever. That's the, we, we know Eli Olam by Ed. And then it goes on and it says a very peculiar, who yenachagehu, yenachagenu al mut. And he guides us. And this is the same verb that we see in the 23rd Psalm. He leads us to still waters. All right. So the same verb, a paths of righteousness. He is, uh, this is the same verbal structure. God guides us, al-mut. Al-mut is very peculiar. It literally means over death. Now, it could be a declaration that walking the path of God is to bring us to eternal life. And that's generally how it's translated. It's a very peculiar construction. And the best that most scholars come across are he will lead us evermore, or he will lead us for eternity. And uh, it isn't quite as, uh, as direct and blunt as over death, but uh, they fall in the same semantic field. So to participate in a Hajj, actually the Hebrew word is regal, a, a walking sacred journey uh, to the city of israel city, the city of jerusalem is a, a truly transcendent event and to do so allows us to participate in eternity so i want to encourage you all to make the trip to israel to go to that modest hilltop uh, where our ancestors found heaven and earth meet and to experience that. But also, you can, if you never quite make it to Israel, take a trip up a mountain, walk around on it, experience that sense of standing between heaven and earth, and see if you're not moved uh, to a sense of the everlasting.
along the way. Thank you all for listening to Psalm 48, and we'll continue next week.